Um, another environmental social theories. So part two. And before we begin uh, part two of environmental social theories, I, I would like to visit uh, those ones we did uh, last week. Uh, three, three slides. I, I, I added another three slides. And these, the second part of the environmental social th theories have already been uploaded with all the updates, including this one and another two slides, which I just uh, added. So the second part of the, uh, sorry, the first part of environmental social theories, which we covered last week, have already updated, uh, no, have al already <coughs> uploaded up to the uh, blackboard of the university. So as a PDF format with the three slides is, uh, in uh, one page. So you can find this on the blackboard. Okay, uh, last week we talking about the environment. What, are, what could be difference between environmental and ecological? Because Riley Dunlap, he, he uh, termed his idea, uh, which he believed he uh, wished uh, to be a foundational basis uh, foundational basis for environmental sociology. Uh, the first time he termed it as environmental, new environmental paradigm, but then later on he changed the name uh, into new ecological paradigm. So I thought there might be some differences between these terms. And last week I asked some of them and we, we, I came up with some answers and I gave you again my answers. And maybe to some of you who still have some blurry, not uh, feeling uh, clear, you maybe uh, have more concrete uh, feeling with what these two terms being different. So basically, when you say environmental, it's a relational concept. So when uh, when a things be defined in a relational, there should be some a subject and object, like a father and child, and teacher and student and um, uh, dictator and di di dictated so so but then the ecological it's not a relational concept it's a it's a concept used to uh, to to describe the interconnected relationships among members of a natural world so for me why why it don't make differentiations to use uh, environmental paradigm, ecological paradigm, no, uh, the contents are same, but the terming are uh, a bit different. So I, 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 I consider that uh, when you say environment, it's a more like a util utilization view, uh, so to speak, that when you say environment, you consider nature as a kind of um, the something, something you can use. So it, it emphasizes nature it's something you can use, you see? So, and many people consider nature as an environment because in nature uh, provides many things for human life. You can take a rest in nature and you can extract natural resources for uh, exercising your academic activities. You, you can do many things with nature. So that's why uh, it can condition, it can influence human life to be shaped a certain way. But when you say ecological, it's more like, uh, so this one is more like a utili utilization view. So you emphasize nature as something you can use for, but for some, some purposes. But when you, uh, s the nature, nature world with the name uh, ecological, it means more like a ecocentric view. So if they if they if ecosystem has to be protected it has to be protected for its own right independently uh, from any purpose uh, any usefulness for human society I think these two terms are uh, different in those uh, senses okay mm -hmm. and we go to another one which I am not uh, added so this, I want to show the contradiction, the, the Marxist, eco-Marxist and treadmill of productions, particularly eco-Marxist, they criticize the capitalist uh, production system does not uh, the harmony with the natu natural system. 
because capitalist system, capitalist production system is, is for uh, accumulating profit. So finally, they want to do money, 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 but a lot more money, a lot more money, 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 money. So, but then where does money come from? <laughs> the money comes from nature, right? It all starts from nature. So to, to create, to, to manufacture like a photocopying paper or what, 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 whatever sort of uh, papers, the, the raw materials come from nature. The trees, right? Am I right? Yes, I'm right. All right. Okay. So we need the trees to create, to manufacture what kinds of papers that we use on an ev everyday basis, whether it's uh, photocopying paper, whether it's uh, toilet paper, whether it's uh, uh, garbage paper. So, but then the thing is, uh, under the capitalist production system, to accumulate uh, wealth in a shorter period, uh, a lot, you need the trees a lot. And, but then there's a contradiction within the time in ecological process, within the time uh, in social process. In social process, the social actors like you and me, the human beings, they are involved. I I interactions, when you say a human being is a, a social being, that implies that an individual makes uh, some uh, um, interactions with other individuals to achieve certain purposes, right? So I said uh, uh, society that all the time involves social process. So uh, think about to accumulate wealth. There are thousands and thousands of actors involved uh, cutting trees and then uh, manufacturing photocopying papers in a factory, and then it goes to a market, and there's a consumers who want to buy these photocopying papers to print their uh, documents into a paper, into a, into a paper. So these are all the human beings involved in this process, in it's called the social process. And over the ecological process, there are members of natural world, like uh, trees, and there are also other members that uh, make the e ecosystem with the trees. For example, Rachel, the who 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 are there that makes the ecosystem that makes the interconnected relationships with the trees in nature? Sorry, birds. Okay, birds. Yeah, great. Yeah. A bird, they need trees, right, to sit on and to, to make songs and, you know, and to make nests and so on. Killa, apart from birds. Mm. I don't know, like insects and stuff. Insects, yeah, sure, sure. T there are probably thousands and thousands different kinds of insects, particularly for, for these uh, long, uh, tall trees, right? Um, xiong, yo xiong. Mm -hmm. Birds, insects, there are probably a lot of you know, different members that, that make uh, interconnected relationships with the trees, right? Apart from birds and insects. Water, okay, moisture, moisture in soil, okay? And, jishik. Um, Animals, to be specific? What kind of animals? Take it easy, I mean, you know. Sorry? We be tree? Living in trees. Animals living in trees. For example, Ah, monkeys, right? Okay, monkeys, good, good. So they all have some connected uh, interrelationship with the trees, monkeys and birds and insects and soils and moisture and so on and so on. But then the thing is, the time in ecological process for a tree to grow, and, and with the sun and also for a, to, 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 uh, a tree to grow, it takes longer years, it takes longer years 
compared to the social process, the full uh, wealth to be uh, to be uh, come out to be made. So which means which means uh, ecological Marxists consider capitalism uh, does not make sense. Does not make sense, uh, uh, particularly considering nature as a repository uh, reservoir, because. The contradiction. It's, a, it's called social ecological. Uh, it's, a, it's called ecological social system dialectic. It's a contradiction between the time in ecological process and the time in uh, in social process. So you 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 want you are a capitalist and you want to make a lot of um, a lot of money, which means you need a lot of trees at first in the beginning. And that means you have to cut a lot of trees. But then the problem is, once you cut a lot of trees, once uh, those, those uh, trees are being cut to grow back, it takes much longer years for uh, a, uh, the system, the social system, to produce certain, uh, certain amount of wealth. So they say it's a kind of a collision, collision the contradiction between ecological process and social process. OK, I have added another one. Ah, and I researched about the, the time needed for a tree to, to grow full. For example, we, for human beings, how long does it take for a, a human being to grow full? Lina, can you share with us your height? Okay, if you if you don't mind. Uh, I don't really know it, but it's around five feet. Oh, we are not just feet. Oh, um, Meters. Oh, one one hundred. Yeah, one meter. Yeah, one meter. Yeah, one meter. Yeah, one So that's the that when was the year? When was the time that your your height just stopped in in that size? Two years ago. Ah, two years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, Okay, okay. But usually for a full human to grow, it usually takes 20, uh -huh. 21 years. Sure. Normally, human beings also, it, like uh, some people, they stopped growing uh, uh, 17 years old or 16 years old, sometimes 20 and 20 year on years old, to reach a certain, you know, uh, the full, to grow full. It's some same mechanism with the trees also. So s some trees, they take. Uh, 10 years to grow full and 2,000 years to grow full and some uh, trees are very little even 1.5 1, 1 centimeters and some trees even go uh, very tall and more than 100, 155 meters. Okay, so the for, for a tree to grow taller than others, it means it takes longer hours, lo uh, sorry, longer years to grow. But imagine that those trees are taking 2,000 years, but you cut them all, which means it needs another 2,000 years for those trees to be recovered, to grow back, right? But can you, can you wait? <laughs> I mean, in, in the social process. So that's why they, they consider within the uh, capitalist production system, the time in ecological process, the time in, in uh, ec social process to make money, and the time in ecological pr pr process to, to for, um, for tree to grow and for other also, it, it applies to other, uh, other members in the natural world. So I added also another one. I want to mention this, the metaphor of treadmill. Treadmill, it, it implies uh, it indicates uh, society formation, how society works, how society works. And they said, it's the, using the metaphor treadmill, they want to say a uh, society kind of struck, stuck to a, a, a state that is parallel to a treadmill. So if you go on, if you're running on a treadmill, you cannot move forward. You just are uh, running on the same same place. So, Alan Schneiberg considered that under the capitalist production uh, system, society in terms of the economy, the relationship between the economy and the um, nature, between the economy and the environment, they consider 
society functions, society works like a, uh, like a treadmill, which means that you can uh, earn money, you can earn money, but that comes with a negative thing in the environment. That's why society does not come forward. Society all the time, you know, running in one place. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. If, if, the, uh, if you can imagine, you can consider society moving forward, you can say uh, these two things are possible. So you, it, it's like a win-win game. Society members, society gain a larger uh, capital, larger wealth. And at the same time, you can preserve the environment. That means society going moving forward. But um, Alan Schneider does not believe that way. You are increasing the wealth comes with the sacrificing the environment. So that's why society just cannot move forward. Instead, just running in one place. So which means it's a it's a opposite idea uh, to 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 uh, the. Anthropo anthropocentric view, anthropocentric view, they believe that human society can progress infinitely without limit. But, but then he, he attacked those ideas that uh, under the capital system, those old accumulation of uh, economic activity comes with the environmental abuse. Means there's one thing, good thing, it's a good thing, you can earn a lot of money, that's a good thing. But then that comes with a bad thing. So it's somehow like a zero-sum game. So you, you're just stuck in a treadmill. You can never go forward. Does it make sense? OK. Thank you. And also, it's another part of consumption. Uh, the Alan Schneiberg, uh, originally, he, he only mentioned the production, production. But another theorist, they added consumption part also, but you see uh, people are considered to consume for happiness, for feeling good, for feeling fulfilled, for feeling ha 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 ha. But then it comes with a loss of community. People, op when they consume a, a lot, uh, once uh, they, they, they become uh, separated from other members in a society. So it's also the same story. Um, you're probably very good, it's prob very good. You consume, uh, you consume a lot and you connected your, your community members. That means the society go moving forward. But then uh, these uh, Marxist uh, thinking uh, theorists, they do not believe their way. If you consume too much, you can be isolated from other members of the community. So it, it's like a stick stuck in, a, in a one place. Uh, the good things comes with the bad things. That's why the society cannot go moving forward instead of uh, running in a just one place. OK. OK, now I uh, go to the, uh, the topic for today, part two. Today we learn ecological modernization theory, and I'll abbreviate it as EMT. And the second one is a political ecology, and the third one is a Yevon's uh, paradox. And fourth is a social constructionist perspective. And then I summarize all the theories which we learned from uh, last week and today in the name of the, uh, the epistemological debates in environmental sociology. If you remember the, the history, development history of environmental sociology, in the 1990s, environmental sociology saw significant um, development in theory makings. And as time uh, went by, um, the moving toward 2000, there are more theories comes up. There are more theories comes up, and now it has the theoretical ori orientation now very diversified. Uh, then, the, the in, then the beginnings, then uh, in the 90s, uh, Riley Donner visioned uh, environmental sociology to be uh, founded uh, based upon a, a new ecological paradigm. Now there are a lot of uh, theories rather than new ecological paradigm. And I uh, summarized those uh, theoretical uh, um, debates 
in environmental sociology in the, in the final. Okay, ecological modernization theory is very famous. It's very famous. And these two men, particularly Arthur Moore, is a big name. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very famous theory in environmental sociological theory. And it was proposed in the 1990s. So those are all big theories, like a risk, risk society thesis. If we learn uh, uh, warning after, those all the, the grand, I mean, those all the big theories that are uh, quoted by many of uh, the many uh, researchers were proposed in the 1990s. And Arthur Moore is a Dutch guy, Dutch guy. And his colleague, Gert Spagran, uh, they both um, contributed to develop ecological modernization theory. They believe that modernization project does not fail, does not fail. Modernization project does, has not failed. Uh, and then, but then they said, uh, modernization project that uh, the society transit from tradition to modernization. They say the uh, industrial modernization does, n does not consider the uh, environment impact of modernization projects upon um, nature, the impact of uh, modernization projects upon the nature, particularly the negative impact of um, human activities upon nature. So they propose ecological modernization, ecological modernization. This means you can keep continuing modernization project, but then at the same time, you, you, you pay your attention to your uh, activities, uh, negative impact upon um, natural environment. So it sounds very, um, very fancy, right? Very fancy. And uh, different to, different to uh, ecological Marxist thinking, they believe society can progress. And so uh, they, they also uh, criticized industrial modernization. modernization. Modernization brought human beings, uh, wealth, and way, uh, reason, reason, thinking, the re uh, rational thinking, and particularly technology. That's all. Technology is the symbol, is the flower of modernization project. If you remember the society transformation, you go to, uh, if you go to society transformation, okay? So industrial society, it's, a, it's the beginning of a modernization project. It's, a, it's the beginning of modernization projects. So what's the difference between uh, hunting and gathering society, the co the including hunting, gathering, pastoral, agricultural society uh, with the industrial society? The key uh, factor that makes difference in the so industrial society from the previous types of societies is the using technology, right? So you use technology within these uh, factory uh, settings. You, you work outside, not in a box, not in a, the, in a building box. You work outside, right? Hunting, gathering, pastoral, agriculture. You work outside, not inside. Right. And also, there's a huge involvement of technology to organize human activities, whatever in production side or in, in family life, in, in many, many parts of society formation, technology, was, technology is uh, hugely involved. So uh, ecological modernization theorists believe that the, begin, the beginning of industrial society, when, when industrial society uh, began, what, what, what made the industrial society begin? Damaris? Uh, I know in America, mm. World War II made industrial society really popular. Mm -hmm. We needed to produce all the weapons, and we needed to mass produce things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know about other countries. Mm -hmm. The very first event which took in England, in Europe, huh? 
steam engine, yeah. We call all that is an industrial revolution, right? Industrial revolution. Before that, you use your muscles or animals' muscles to create uh, products, whatever it, it's an agriculture product and something like that. You use your 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 muscle or animals' muscles. But then all of a sudden, steam power. You can use steam steam power to get the train to move from London to Manchester. It takes like 18 hours or 27 hours, so on, so on. So technology is the very, very the the very factor to get industrial society to take place, and the, the event we call that the industrial revolution, right? So it's a big change, a huge change. So when people living in outside to find the food, to organize their lives, generation generations, it probably they made they did not make that much negative impact upon nature, right? Think about the lives of hunting and gathering society. Think about the human beings living in pastoral society, living in agricultural society. The way they do organize their lives, whether to find the food or to, to do whatever, the way they do organize their lives probably does not make them much impact upon nature. But from industrial society, the story had changed, the story had changed, and then um, many uh, environmental sociologists believe that the industrial society uh, impact negatively upon natural environment because uh, industrial society is a technology combined with the chemicals. So from trees to become photocopying paper, uh, you need a thousand, thousand different techniques. You need the pulping tec tec techniques and technology and so on and so on. And you need the chemicals to transform natural uh, form into manufactured form, you need the different thousand thousand of uh, chemicals. Think about like uh, from cotton to, to, to be a uh, cotton cloth, you need a thousand thousand different chemicals. And those, if you use chemicals, the, the effect of using them uh, going to, 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 to nature negatively, not positively. So ecological modernization theories, they say, when industrialization began, industrial modernization began, the, those people didn't, did not pay attention, did not pay attention what kind of impact uh, would exert upon uh, nature. They didn't pay that much attention uh, to, to natural environment. But then ecological modernization is different. You do you do, you do whatever activities you do in industrial society, but then at the same time you pay attention to uh, what kind of eff effect that would be uh, upon a natural environment. That that is called ecological modernization. Sounds good. Sounds attractive. Yeah. When it was proposed in the 1990s. Many people are attracted to the, to the idea, but then uh, as time went by, uh, no theory would receive, uh, no theory would uh, be able to avoid critics. But the ecological modernization also uh, receive um, a lot of uh, critics. <coughs> but anyway, you, you think about the society transformation from hunting gathering up to post-industrial. So industrial society just came with uh, about 200, 300 years back. But in Korea, it's probably like uh, 40, 40 years back. Because we consider within South Korean history, the industrialization began late 60s and early 70s. So about 40 years, right? And Damaras says in, in the United States, States uh, the after the Second World War, probably the industrial society is a more blooming rather than beginning, more blooming. What about Australia? When, when did industrial society came in Australia? Um, well, we're like undecentral, but I think it's when like, the British people came over uh -huh. and they sort of introduced it to the Aboriginal people and they started building up things. But like, obviously, like, I'm not like, super sure because I never really 
Uh huh. So that's the like one century. Um, I guess maybe around like the 1800s or something. Or okay, 19th century. Yeah. Okay, okay. So about more than a little bit more than 100. Oh, no, about 200, right? Maybe. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So compared to you know those countries that we refer like advanced countries, advanced industrialized countries, those countries like let's say like a UK, United States, or those uh, countries in Western Europe, they all began industrialization pro projects a lot ahead of other countries, which are termed developing nations or less developed countries. And South Korea is among the countries that um, the began industriali industrialization project quite late, but, but then quite successful. The, the term, the period for experiencing industrialization is quite short, but then uh, the, the in terms of GMP increase, it, uh, the South Korean started uh, industrialization project quite um, somehow successful. And even now, some, are con some, some parts of the world, there are people who live uh, upon hunting and gathering, and who live upon pastoral uh, activities, and who live upon uh, agricultural uh, activities. So ecological modernization theorists believe that they, uh, you can continue industrialization project, you can continue, but you have to pay attention, you have to pay attention uh, the, the environmental impact of your industri industrialization project. Okay, we go back to the one we... Ah, this one, 69. Okay, 68. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, and then also, ecological modernization theorists, they believe that capitalist, capitalism is okay. It, it, it's okay. Capitalism is okay. Capitalism is, is not necessarily, necessarily um, the bad guy for, uh, for environmental problems. We can green in capitalism. You know, you can, we can green capitalism. So they believe that uh, against the treadmill idea, society can go, can move forward. So it's, you can make a win-win game. You can make a lot of money, but then you just at the same time you pay attention uh, to to natural environment. So you can be uh, you can use uh, nature in, in wisely because uh, nature anyway it's the very fu uh, foundation for your economic activities to be possible. So you have to preserve, you have to conserve nature anyway. So, but then ecological modernization theorists believe that you can do both. It, it is possible. They say it, it is possible. And also, also they say capitalism is okay. Maybe it's not that bad. So that's the thing they collide with the ecological Marxist, the treadmill production theorist, and also e new ecological paradigm theorist. They collide. And so they basically, uh, they, they say, we can continue our modernization project. Particularly, they have a strong belief in technology, in technology. So ecological modernization theories, they believe that we need green technology. We need green technology. And you can still produce as many products you want. But then uh, compared to the one, those products, that are produced within the industrial modernization project. Those products that are produced within ecological modernization projects are different. The technology is different, and then the process, the social process, particularly the production process is uh, different. So you can make a, a win-win game. You can make a lot of money, and at the same time, you can uh, protect natural environment. And they say, that's possible. It's a very Dutch thinking, right? It's a very Dutch style. To me, it sounds very Dutch style. Mm -hmm. and very, uh, how can I say, uh, 
practical way of thinking. So uh, once again, they, the modernization project, they believe that it can continue. We, we don't have to give up. Some people said, some people consider industrialization projects that uh, bro they brought uh, a lot of benefit to human life. For example, people become the, the lifestyles, the way people live has been very uh, comfortable has been very comfortable with the help of technology. And you can enjoy many different thousand, thousand kinds of consumer products. That's all the good part of industrialization project brought to human beings. But the negative part is the negative part is uh, uh, the shaking of natu natural system. Too many extractions of nature, natural resources and also through the production process the people do not consider them much the negative impact upon natural environment. Also, uh, through consumption process, people do not consider them much negative impact of their consumption activities upon natural environment, right? So, but then uh, ecological modernization theorists, they believe we can green every part of human life so that we don't have to give up modernization. We don't have to give up modernization. We can still keep developing new technology, new technology, new technology. That's OK. And also capitalism is OK. You know, we can create a large benefit, large wealth, not large amount of money, 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 money. It's OK. It's all the against, it's all the colliding with the idea, particularly with the ecological Marxists. And also, it's a kind of um, anthropocentric view. Anthropocentric view. That's the way uh, being cri criticized by Wally uh, Donner, like a new ecological paradigm theorist. They consider this idea is a very anth anthropocentric view. It sounds quite fancy. It sounds on the surface. They say you can uh, you can do both. You can play the both. Win win, that, you know, you can get money and you can also conserve the nature. You can do both and then we can keep progressing. We can keep progressing. That we can do that. But so that's, that's the, the main major idea. That's the main, main idea. It can be possible. So, uh, they're thinking, I find very practical. If, if that can be possible, probably it's the number one theory for our new vision of greening society. Because if, uh, because some people, they say, with, if environmental problems are becoming serious, probably we have to give up modernization project. We have to give up industri industrialization. We have to give up modernization. Whatever you do, pr uh, manufacture in a factory, that kind of production system, we have to give up. But they say, no, 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 we don't have to give up. We just keep, keep, can uh, produce uh, our product in a factory. That's OK. But then technology and also production process and also consumption process should be changed in an ecological way. And that, that's we believe, that's what e uh, e uh, ecological modernization believe possible, right? So because some, some theorists, they say, we have to go back to agricultural society. If we keep moving forward, like a post-industrial, another industrial, you know, post-post-industrial, <coughs> that means that you still uh, you keep continuing. You you continue making products in a factory, in a factory setting, with uh, machines that are updated with some um, some t some technologies. But some people say we have to give up industrialization projects, which means we have to go back to agricultural society. But these people, they do not, uh, do not like that kind of suggestion. And they say it's possible. We, we can keep producing and we can uh, conserve uh, natural environment. So, so they say uh, capitalism is also uh, OK. It, uh, it can be uh, greened through environmental reforms. Environmental reforms is, uh, comes with the environmental policy. So uh, the government and then capitalists, the producers and civil society, they can come all together uh, to, to conserve nature 
and also to make um, to make benefits to 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 make money. And it's all, all all possible if we have a good environmental policy with a good environmental reform programs. You can keep continuing your industrialization project, and also you can uh, conserve um, natural environment. And they um, they consider company company like a pr production company. Let's just say photocopying company. Let's just say uh, thousand thousand South Korean company. They produce wide report and they record, you know, their behaviors in, in, in the production process, and they also greening their production process, which means they try to keep their um, the pollution level at least as least, uh, not to pollute uh, uh, the natural environment through their production process, and they can reorganize the, their institutional arrangement and they can uh, develop green technology. And that comes all with to, to, to both the making money and conserving nature, that these two pro projects, these two uh, purposes can be possible. So they, um, the practical aim with the uh, ecological modernization strategies is uh, developing green technology. Green technology, okay, say, let's say, you have uh, many different kinds of machines in a factory to produce photocopying paper. And then let's say like uh, machines that uh, produce photocopying paper 50 years and just one year, one year ago, the, the difference should be uh, made for whether the technology reduced, redu whether the technology can, can reduce the negative impact within the process um, the, the photocopying paper uh, are, are made. So I said uh, you need a lot of chemical compounds you know, to transform nature into manufactured products. So the thing is how to reduce the negative impacts of the chemical compounds upon a natural environment. Okay, but then uh, I later on I, I explain, but this also received a lot of critics, particularly from the ecological Marxist. And now I move to political ecology. Uh, political ecology, the politics is about the human uh, activities. When you, th when, you, when you think of politics, what kind of image uh, come to your mind? When you think about political activities, politicians, politics, so on, so on, what, what kind of image come to your mind? Lin Weiwei, Lin Weiwei didn't come, no? What kind of images uh, come to your mind? Uh, we have uh, Na Young. Nayan, Nayan, okay. Mm -hmm. When you hear uh, political institutions, politicians, political behaviors, political activities, what kind of images come to your mind? Right. Huh? <laughs> right. What? What are they? Right. Left and right. No, no. Mm. Human rights. Ah, human rights. Okay. And Uh-huh. Did you learn political sociology? Yes. Okay. What did you learn? What uh, politics is about? Okay, 
if you ask the, the question to me, when I think about politics, the very first image that comes to my mind is the power. Power. So seizing the power, losing the power, and negotiating the conflict ideas among society members, that's all about politics, right? So I'm if, let's say, if I become a president, OK, I have this idea, I have my colleagues. Probably we feel very you know, confident because we can do whatever, whatever things we want, you know. Because, it's, it's, it, because uh, I can exercise the power and open that comes with the author, uh, authorized power. Because if you vote the person to be elected as a parliament member or to be a president, or whatever, you give your power to, 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 to that person who, who, who are on behalf of you exercise some uh, organization, how, how to design your country, how to design your economy, and so on and so on. So for me, politics is all about power, you know, losing power, seizing power, and how to organize, how to, uh, particularly how to negotiating the people, uh, the, the different ideas, sometimes the conflict ideas uh, among society members. Right? Okay. So political ecology, you consider those political images, right? I, I say power, seizing power, you know, negotiating, the, uh, adjusting those different ideas among society members. Sometimes the difference can make conflict, like a collide, like a you know, crash. So you, you consider those kind of political process. But then uh, with the topic of uh, environment issues, environment issues, let's say for example, you have to decide, okay, we, we will produce, let's say in South Korea, we have 100 photocopying company. Photocopying company, do we have? We have a photocopying company in South Korea? Or do we import all those photocopying papers from United States or from Hong Kong or somewhere? Do we have photocopying paper company? You can name them. No? Do, do we have our own? We have a car company, right? In South Korea, we have a, South Korea can uh, the produce cars, computers, laptops, many things uh, South Korea can uh, produce, right? What about photocopying papers? Because photocopying papers, it creates, it asks for a lot of uh, trees. Sometimes old growth trees, which means it takes up about 100 years to 100. So many photocopying uh, papers, they have their own uh, forest station. They create forest. Yeah. Because it's difficult to hunt forest, you know. Normally in South Korea, we don't have a big, large, you know, the forest. Which means it's another globalization is issue. You have to find, you have to go to another country, and you have to negotiate with the uh, the um, the government in the uh, in the country, which has a lot of high, you know, the tall sized uh, trees, to produce photocopying paper and to export and to consume it in South Korea and so on. So on. Okay, you have to make that kind of uh, the decision, right? You you have to that kind of uh, decision. Think about car company, car. We have a car company, right, in South Korea. In Hong Kong? In China? Yeah. China has a car company? Yeah. Ah, boom. Yeah. Oh, yeah? It's not the uh, US company transferring their uh, factories in China. It's not like that? Yeah, US and Korea and so on, so on, right? Yeah, OK, OK. Uh, for example, think about car company. You also need the uh, natural materials to produce cars, right? Uh, it's a different thing uh, that create photocopying paper. What kind of natural things necessary to create uh, cars? B. To produce cars, what kind of uh, natural uh, form, natural materials we do you need? Aluminum? Plastic? Lesser? 
uh, leather is not the natural the animal uh, skins. Steel. Huh? Steel. Steel? Ah, yeah. steel, yeah, S-T-E-E-L. -E -E great, great, okay. <coughs> and they are all underground? They are all underground? Australia has a lot of uh, natural resources underground. Yeah. Australia has a lot. Right. Yeah. So they don't have to produce cars. <laughs> they can't sell their natural resources underground. That's why their, their mining company, mining industry developed well, you know. So, 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 uh, sorry, Australia doesn't have that much uh, manufacturing companies. Right? That's why the country is clean or everywhere, you know. They, they don't have them, they just have LG. <laughs> they have a, the, if you go to home, if you go to the household, the, the home, home household, they have a LG um, refrigerator and Samsung TVs and so on, laptops and so on. So think about to produce cars like Hyundai, Samsung, and uh, uh, blah blah blah. You know, Sangyong, blah blah blah. And uh, they have to uh, decide where to extract natural resources, where to go, and how how much they can extract, and how much money they have to pay, and then so on, so on, so on. And they kind of the decision does not make alone within the company. That's all the time in connection with the government. It also made uh, with the government, but sometimes in in the process, government makes some kind of you know shuffling games, maybe to favor some companies and not to favor some companies. Maybe some more like a political process uh, that take place in the in the government in relation to 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 companies. So that's what all uh, political ecologists trying to understand. Uh, you, they use political uh, perspective understanding our environment issues, but particularly, particularly Western-style political ecologists, they're more uh, interested in the, the, the first and third world relationships. Because normally the third world is uh, their um, society formation, mainly agricultural society, but, but at the same time they have a, a lot of natural resources but they don't have that much technology and they don't have that much uh, industrialization uh, basis. But then the first word, opposite, it's mainly uh, post-industrial society and having a uh, high technology, having high money, having greater money and so on and so on. So normally they go to the third world, they normally they go to the third world, you can say the third is a less developed country or developing countries. Countries. So, like uh, um, the big companies, like Apple or big companies, they go to uh, Malaysia or or uh, Indonesia and so on to find uh, the materials to to create their laptops, the Apple, the fancy laptops. But then they probably the somehow kind of political process between the first world and the third world, right? And the third world normally is based upon doing agricultural. Those uh, countries of the third world, those uh, populations of the third world country, mainly upon a uh, primary basis uh, of nature, either the fishing or agricultural or horticultural or cattle raising. But then the first world, then normally either post-industrial uh, and industrial, and they, they normally they, uh, the populations of the first world countries are employed in a factory or in, a, um, in an office and so on. So uh, they can be considered natural resources uh, provider within the global economy setting. And they considered uh, kind of global uh, producer, global producer. So political ecologists, uh, they want to understand the first and the third world relationships in terms of uh, manufacturing 
in terms of uh, natural resource provision and manufacturing uh, goods. Okay, now I move to Yevon's paradox. Yevon's paradox. So, parad paradox is a uh, William Stanley Yevon's. In, in the in 1865, he proposed this pr paradox. He said that it's the kind of a double phase of technology. We believe technology brings us a lot of good things, right? All the the all the things we feel, uh, we enjoy comfortable. We enjoy um, being comfortable. That comes with the technology development, whether it's a car or a computer. Whatever, whatever, that all comes with the technologi uh, technological development, right? But then uh, some people also said technological development can uh, contribute increasing efficiency with the natural resources that is used. But another, uh, another, another aspect of uh, technological uh, progress, technological uh, improvement, is that People believe that on the surface, if you uh, improve technology, you can increase efficiency with the natural resources is to be used, which means you can reduce the amount of natural resources to produce one, uh, one product with a better technology uh, uh, with the better technology development. But at the same time, but on, on the other uh, phase of uh, technological improvement, is if uh, the, 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 the better, better, better technology uh, can, decrease, can decrease the amount of natural resources, and that means increase the efficiency of uh, natural resources use. But then consumption part, people are, the consumer's desire to use those products that come with uh, technological, develop, uh, technological improvement with, uh, and 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 need uh, those resources to be to be decreased, but then consumption uh, rate is increasing with the uh, increasing of uh, consumers' demand. So that's the kind of paradox. People believe that technology can give us uh, saving the amount of natural resources, but then, but then. Uh, if uh, consumers uh, want more, 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 that, that kind of achievement becomes useless. That's, that is called Yevon's paradox, Yevon's paradox. That, that is called the Yevon's paradox. So in environmental sociology, there are quite uh, debates, uh, quite strong debates about technology, how we how we conceptualize technology, in what way we, we see we see technology. But then Yevon's paradox, in paradox, not paradise, Yevon's paradox indicates that technological improvement has one story and, and, and the another story, and the another story. If uh, consumers' demand stabilized, or if consumers' uh, demand decreased, with the technological progress, with technological progress by which amount of natural resources uh, to be to be decreased, it can be a good thing, right? But then, uh, with the consumption side, the consumers can uh, can want more, can want more, and that means the achievement is made in production side. It becomes um, not not that useful, not that useful in terms of. Uh, conserving the amount of uh, natural resources. Okay, now I go to social constructionist view. Social construction view. The, all the things we mentioned so far now, like uh, whether it's a new ecological modernization theory or a new ecological paradigm or ecological Marxist, ecological Marxism or the political ecology, uh, what else? <coughs> Those are all the theories I mentioned so far, they consider <coughs> environmental pro uh, problems are real, are real. It exists in a real term, it exists in an objective sense. 
you can observe them, you know, that exists in real term. But social construction is consider <coughs> environmental problems in a different way. It might sound a bit tricky. It might, it, the social constructionist perspective is influenced by postmodernist thinking, and their way of thinking is maybe somehow uh, tricky. But social constructionists consider nature uh, rather is a symbolic and cultural construct rather than physical construct. That is a big thing that makes all the theories that, that we have uh, covered so far. Uh, <coughs> political ecologist, ecological Marxist, the new ecological paradigm theorist, and new, uh, uh, sorry, ecological modernist theorists, they all consider nature as a physical uh, object. And then the problems in the physical object in, in nature are real and you can observe, and so that we have to uh, solve the problems. But social constructionists, they do not consider nature as a physical thing. They consider nature as a cultural and symbolic construct. So it's a very different idea. Very different idea. So for social constructionists, whether their uh, environmental problems are or not does not that much important for them. What is what matters, what is important for them is to find out what kind of uh, the nature, what parts of nature are considered to have problems through society members' communication process. Tricky, right? They, they do not say, okay, we are not that much interested in uh, to, to say, we are not, we are not in much interested in uh, saying definitely whether they environment prob problems or not. What we are interested in, uh, to knowing in through what process, to what kind of social process are involved to define certain aspects of nature to have problems through society members' communication process. Because think about nature. Nature has a lot of different thousand, thousand different members, insects, animals. Animals has also a lot of thousand, thousand members, right? Animals. If you consider animals, there are, uh, you, you ask animal experts, they can give you a lot of thousand, thousand uh, different members, animals, even birds and soil, trees, whatever, whatever. Nature consists of a lot of different thousand thousand of um, different things. But then when, when uh, certain things come up as having problems, among many different kinds of uh, things that consist of nature, certain uh, things to be picked up and, and being defined as having problems, right? Okay. If you do not well understand now, I, I keep saying this kind of thing. Even if you go up to the uh, okay, let's go up to the, the teaching outline. Teaching out. Can you, would you be able to go up uh, go to the teaching outline? When you mentioned that when you cover the global political um, global environmental politics, which we will do in. Which date? Global environmental politics. Yeah, May 31st, we will do global environmental politics. I will also mention this kind of social constructionist view because when environmental problems are settled in a global uh, agenda, which means global leaders, they talk about environmental problems, but then in the 70s, the depletion of natural resources is a more, uh, more big issue to, to talk about. But 80s, the, t the discussion topic a little bit changed. And 90s, climate change came in as a major environmental problem. 
So uh, the social constructionists, they're more interested in uh, the social process through uh, society members' communication process by which certain aspect of natural environment to be defined as having uh, problems. They are more interested in, in that. So they are a bit uh, detached from, uh, from saying, oh, we have to uh, provide solution measures to, to solve the problems, this, this thing, th that thing. They're more interested in, well, OK, maybe environmental problems are real. But, but what, 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 what we are interested, more interested in is to know uh, through what kind of social process are involved to define certain aspect of environment to, 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 have, uh, to have problems. OK? OK, let's have a break. 15 minutes, 12 o'clock, we begin. Of the, the lecture. So, ah. Uh, So social constructionist perspective for environmental problems are very different from all the theories that we have looked at so far. And they, the main difference is social constructionists consider nature as a symbolic and cultural construct rather than physical objective construct, objective reality. So the main argument of social constructionist uh, theorists is that uh, basically, sociologists, environmental sociologists, are not much uh, uh, trained to know well the natural world. So mainly, we use the scientific knowledge that are um, established by natural scientists. Because sociologists is uh, expertise, so, uh, expert for society, not for natural world. Sociologists are experts for social world, not natural world. But then environmental sociologists, you know, you have to do the both. You have to know the natural world. You have to also know the social world. Because environmental sociology is about to explain human society in relation to natural environment. But then uh, social constructionist argument is that because sociologists, uh, environmental sociologists, are not very, very trained to, to judge, to judge well uh, the natural world and to judge uh, the scientific knowledge of natural scientists. We have to rather maintain distance, maintain distance uh, from saying that uh, these things are, these are environmental problems and we have to provide the solution measures and so on. They say we rather focus upon this mission. So that's, they consider the missions of environmental sociologists are totally different from ecological modernization theorists, new ecological paradigm theorists. Uh, the main aim, main mission of environmental sociologists, according to the social constructionist uh, theorists, is to know, is to examine the social process through which environmental programs are constructed. And they say, it does, not mean, it does not mean that environmental problems does not exist. Rather, it means that uh, environmental sociologists should maintain, like it's a uh, kind of doing sociology, what kind of uh, qualities you have to equip doing sociology. So you have to be uh, value neutral, value neutral. You, have, you do not do uh, say like an uh, environmental movement uh, activist. You should be a sociologist, not an activist. So to them, either Riley Dunlop or like eco-Marxist or ecological modernization theorist are all sound like an activist rather than sociologist, if I, if I exaggerate. So they say, you know, if, if you know the debate among Karl Marx and Max Weber, Emil Durkheim, what is the good way to do sociology? Like uh, Karl Marx, they say, you know, all the time philosophers, sociologists say, they say all the time, say blah, 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 blah. But then they never uh, change the society that they want. But what is important for sociologists is to change society uh, for, uh, for what we, we want to live. But then uh, Max Weber, no, you know, we have to be, we are a scientist, we are a social scientist. And we have to 
be like uh, somehow value detached, somehow detached, make a distance from activists and from uh, other uh, people. And we have to be value neutral, we have to be scientist, and we make an, an ob uh, objective uh, observation and so on. The same story, same debate also happened uh, to among, among environmental sociologists. But in the, the very beginning, the very beginning of environmental sociology uh, with the Riley Dunlop's new ecological paradigm, it's a very uh, strong uh, statement that environmental sociologists should pro provide solution measures to, uh, for environmental problems and environmental sociologists uh, should be able to uh, capable to, pre to predict possible uh, ecological crisis and possible social uh, social crisis, so on and so on. Ecological modernization theorists also we have to provide the solution uh, pro problem, solution measures to environmental problems, and according to them, according to them, the solution measures is ecolalizing, ecolalizing, ecolalizing the uh, modernization project. And ecological uh, Marxists, according to them, to solve solution measures to environmental problems is to overturn capitalist production uh, system. So they all try to, they all consider environmental problems are real and environmental sociologists should provide the solution measures for environmental problems that are identified. But social constructionists do not agree with them. So <laughs> yeah, you see, so that's why I said in the 90s and 2000s, theoretical orientations in environmental sociology divergent, has been uh, divers diversified. In the beginnings, they sing all the same voice, you know, la la la, you know, we are facing ecological crisis and that all means social, social crisis. They all singing in the same voice. But in the 90s, in the 2000s, the voice becomes all div divergent and particularly social constructionist uh, vision for environmental problems fundamentally different from other uh, theories. The focal, the, focal, the, the focal examination point and also what environmental sociologists, sociologists have to do are totally uh, different from the, those, uh, the theories that we, we, we saw far. So basically they ask that environment Natural environment consists of many different thousand kinds of uh, things, whether it's animals or plants, birds, whatever, 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 many different kinds of things. But then uh, for a certain period, period, certain things picked up to be defined as problems. But certain periods, like 80s, certain things picked up as having problems. And he said, even some problems are more uh, serious than other problems. If communications, like particular media, they do not pay attention, those things cannot be pro uh, problem, uh, problematized. So they want to uh, emphasize the, the, law, the role of media and the role of the scientist to knowing the social process by which certain aspects of natural environment to be uh, shared upon, to be light upon, and to be recognized uh, by society members as having uh, environmental problems. Okay. So they said, um, like the 60s, 70s, the main focal po point of environmental problems are different from those things uh, in the 80s and those things in the 90s, in the 2000s. And they say, why? Because the media, particularly the media, if the, the media, even if the certain uh, things, certain aspect of 
certain kinds of natural environment is uh, more, more serious, if the media didn't pay attention to the problems, they cannot receive public uh, recognition. Uh, so to, to know the social process, the, the, behavior, the behavior of media, how they frame the problems, you know, the, the, prob uh, the behavior of media is important to know the uh, social process through which uh, certain environmental uh, components are considered having the problems. Now I uh, give you some case study. John Hannigan, to support his argument, John Hannigan provide this uh, case study. John Hannigan is the kind of king of social constructions perspective. In his book, the originally published in, the, in 1996, and now is a third edition, third update, Third update uh, has been uh, uh, the published two, two years back. Now already three, uh, three years back, 2014. But it has received, particularly the second one, it has received thousand thousand um, attentions, and it sold well. The book, the academic book, normally does not sold well, do, does not sell well. But the second edition of uh, John Hannigan's Environmental Sociology book uh, was uh, sold very, 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 very well. Anyway, he provided this case study. He, he, uh, he mentioned the wild preservation movement in the US. And then they say, the way American people uh, view wildlife changed dramatically uh, from, they say, in the, from uh, 19th century, they say they consider wildlife something threat to, to human existence. So wildlife uh, in the 19th century, in the 18th, 19th century, wildlife was considered as something to be tamed down, to be like uh, trimmed down by, human, um, by humans. It's something threat to human settlement, wildlife, right? But then in the late 19th, 19th century, there's a movement of wild preservation movement. So the view to see wildlife changed dramatically in a way, uh, saying that now wild, we need a wildness. We, uh, before wildness was considered something uh, threat, threat, threatened, something threat, sorry, something threat. So and particularly for civilization, you should be cultivated, it's, you should be tamed. But then with the uh, wild preservation movement, the view among shared among uh, the Americans changed in a way to uh, wildlife as having a romantic, romantically uh, charged. And then uh, so sometimes uh, people, some American people, they say, we need wildlife to enjoy our civilization life. Before it was considered a threat to human existence, threat to hu uh, human civilization. But the, in the late 19th century, the, with the wild preservation movement, the view, the, the way American people to view wildness totally changed, and they began to um, value, value wildness. For example, uh, you know the cow cowboy, the American cowboy. In the in the outback, uh, not in the outback. Th they are the considered frontiers, to, you know, to to tame to to tame down, to cultivate wildness. Okay, they uh, it was considered in the beginning of American settlement, it was considered threat to human existence. But with the uh, um, as time went to by, in the late 19th century, there is a movement going back to nature, going back to wildlife. And the way people talk about wildlife totally changed, saying that, oh, now we need uh, wildlife, and we need a wildlife experience uh, to enjoy uh, civilization and so on. And uh, that's the one uh, argument, one uh, s uh, the support, one evidence uh, statement made by John Hannigan, saying that uh, nature is a rather uh, cultural construct than a physical construct. 
So the, the way society members talk about wildlife in the American history uh, in 18th century, 17th century, particularly in the settlement period of American population, wildlife considered negatively. But then in the late 19th century, the way American people talk about wildlife changed very, um, very positively, very positively. So all the, you know, the Boy Scout, Girl Scout, what do they do? They go to wild. They go camping in nature, you know. You have been a uh, Boy Scout or Girl Scout member? You? Okay, what did you do? Uh, we went camping. And yeah, camping okay. And mm -hmm. We would go out and we would go to like conservation centers. Sure. And then my brother was actively in Boy Scouts too and he constantly went on like two week, two week hiking trips or sure. like exploring the wilderness and just living in that environment. Mm -hmm. and also, as a little kid, he would learn and go to like environment centers and learn how to protect the wild and learn how to reuse uh, reuse, like reduce, reuse, and recycle, and then when they were camping. Sure, sure, okay. So mm -hmm. th those are all the Boy Scout and Girl Scout. It, it was created, we disappeared with the wild preservation movement. Mm -hmm. And then they said, for if we human beings to be civilized, we need a wildness. So now we have to protect the wildness. Before, wildness is a danger, you know, wildness have to go on, wildness have to trim the down, wildness have to be something, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then in the late 19th century, they kind of came with a new idea to consider uh, wildlife. But then why? Ah, okay. Hobi, go on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I uh, I say why. Okay. Uh huh. Hoben was trying to ask it why why the transformation of views uh, towards uh, wildlife among uh, American people. And now I say why. Okay. Okay. John Hannigan said why the the views about wildness transformed dramatically from positive to negative, from threat to something to be preserved. They say. In the late 19th century, America saw spreading urban urbanization, which means they many many of population they used to live like a rural settings, or particularly rural setting, you know. But then in the in the in the in the late 19th century, as the time went to uh, towards 19th century, the end of 19th century, many parts of the United States become urbanized, which means the rural things are cut off, and then buildings like this are built up. So it's a kind of romanticism. It's a kind of, um, uh, what is it called? You miss, you miss all the things that you once have. So what is it called? Um, okay. Anyway, uh, the, the, the first thing is that the urbanization, urbanization is spreading out. So which means those places used to be rural areas turned to be cities. And which means those uh, areas used to be green or natural part uh, turned to be gray buildings. Like, like Seoul. Like Seoul. Seoul also used to be uh, uh, agricultural uh, areas, even Gangnam. Up to 60s, it's all agricultural field. You know, I can show you some photo. You know, in the 60s, uh, 70s, which are taken for Gangnam area, there are green, uh, there are agricultural fields, uh, agricultural land, and the, with the cows plowing. You know, but now with the all the building pack up uh, building blocks, and you can. It's very difficult to imagine. Just uh, 30 or 30 or 40 years back, it was full of uh, agricultural. Uh, areas, right? Okay. So United States, they experience a lot more the urbanization history far earlier than South Korea. And so urbanization came with the industrialization because when people, uh, you know, in, if you live in an agricultural society, you live in a rural area, right? And you walk outside agricultural field. But then once society turns to 
industrial society, people begin to live in an urban area. Why? If a society transforms to industrial society, people begin to live in a city, living in an urban area. Why? Capturing the many people. Sorry? Capturing the many people in one place. Yes, you can go further. So uh, people have to gather around the city to work. Okay, the main thing, very, very good answer, but then the main thing is that the factories, uh, who's did the factories normally uh, uh, built in a city, not in a rural area. Factories, uh, like an industrial complex, those things, are built in a city. That's why people move to city and it, it means the spreading of urbanization. The so industrialization, urbanization come all the time together. Capital? Okay. So, United States uh, experienced those industrialization, urbanization far earlier than, you know, other Asian countries and so on. So, that kind of gives them uh, melancholy, not mel ah, nostalgia, nostalgia. So, that gives uh, American people to miss those missing uh, green, you know, the green, uh, green, uh, the back, green state, green settings that they used to enjoy. But then with the spreading of urbanization, those things are gone. So they feel nostalgia, nostalgia, right? So they feel miss. They feel miss those all the things that they uh, were surrounded by before. But now it's, uh, with all the urbanization, just you, what you can see, the buildings, buildings, and buildings, and buildings. So one time there are thousands, thousands of uh, the trees around, or whatever, uh, particularly the trees not uh, the cultivated. So it's a, it's a wildlife. People consider wildlife something like a threat and so on, so on. But with all the buildings packed up, now you kind of uh, nostalgia feeling that, oh, we miss wildlife. We once were surrounded by all, you know, greens and so on. So that's uh, John Hannigan's idea. Why? So th for him, nature is a cultural construct. Na nature is a symbolic construct. And then, uh, so all the, these things are uh, becoming major dominant social uh, the sentiment. Nature loving uh, activities like a Boy Scout and Girl Scout, and also government uh, established nature park systems and so on. So those kind of sentiment, those kind of uh, missing, uh, m feeling nostalgia with the green things comes with the urbanization and industrialization. Does that make sense? It's something like in, in Korea also, right? Before like, like a 60s and 70s, majority of South Korean population uh, work in uh, agricultural activities. Your, 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 your parents' generation, your parents, uh, parents' generation, they probably, 90% of them probably are all farmers. But now, maybe just uh, t less than 10%, they are considered farmers. And in main, mostly main, many of them, they work either in uh, office buildings or in a factory. Um, not, not, not much uh, work in uh, the agricultural field or seawater as a fisher and so on. So John Hannigan argued that nature is a rather symbolic cultural constru construct and he provided this wild preservation movement by which the way to consider wildlife totally changed amongst, among Americans from negative to, to positive. Uh, think, think about like in Korea, we consider like a, the, the Korean word 촌스럽다. 촌스럽다. Does, this, does that make sense? Sewon? How they can be translated? Chunsurupta? Junior? You know what that means? Does that, does that, does Chunsurupta mean give to you positive or negative meaning? Sorry? Negative meaning? Why? In what way? So you are Chunsurupta, not Chunsurupta? 
sorry. Um, yeah, chonsuropta is something like a, you are like a um, old fashioned, and also you seem to be come from agricultural villages, right? When you say, oh, you are chonsuropta in Korean world, that means somehow like a um, valuing negatively about those uh, agricultural villages, agricultural society, right? And against that, like, uh, you know, do, 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 do. Like, uh, it, 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 it means that one's, one has somehow atmosphere coming from urban areas. In Korean expressions also, the, those chonsuropta and dohe, dohe스럽다, dohe적이다, it has somehow uh, opposite meaning and chonsuropta means negative meaning. It means that you, you kind of have an atmosphere coming from agriculture, so, agriculture villages. But dohe적이다, somehow you have a kind of atmosphere, you know, coming from um, city areas. You don't know dohe적이다, jishik, am I right? Jishik, comes from um, uh, Korean language, Korean language and literature. So he probably knows a lot, you know, more than us about Korean language. R right? Am I right? Dohejogida. Does that does that the uh, correct expression? Dohejogida in Korean language. Yes. Yes. Okay. Dohejogida or do doshijogida? Which one is more? Uh, sound natural. Doshijogida, not dohejogida. When you read, uh, refer to somebody saying that, 그녀는 dohejogin 느낌이 들었다. What do you think, Jiu? Dohejog, doshijog. You never heard of dohejog? Okay, it's a generation gap with me, okay. <laughs> For me, I use those. Okay, anyway, even in Korean language, when you uh, refer to some, uh, like a chonsuropta, it's a kind of a village girl, particularly agricultural village girl, that does mean that somehow negative meaning as compared to uh, 도시적이다, having some urban feeling. But uh, now with uh, some environmental problems, particularly in a city setting in Seoul and so on, with the finders, you know, problem and so on and so on, those uh, the agricultural uh, areas, agricultural villages with uh, enjoying uh, better air quality and so on, they kind of have a, um, the nostalgia among uh, the urbanists living in particularly in Seoul, the big city. I, I, I mentioned these kind of things when we uh, think about Jeju Island. With the, when we will think about Jeju Island, the, can you go to the teaching outline? I will, I will also present my uh, case study about Jeju Island, how the South Korean people talk about Jeju Island differently. Uh, before and now, before and now, and I will also mention some uh, social change and environmental change uh, that happened in Jeju Island for the particularly for the past ten years, and I also some use some social construction perspective for that study also. So that's the idea of John Hannigan. So think about it, okay? And now we move to epistemological debates in environmental sociology from the 1990s. So if you remind of the, Im the, so the history of environmental sociology, which we covered for the second week, environmental sociology began late 60s and early 70s in, 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 in the United States. So those quite big names from environmental sociology come from United States and also from, uh, uh, from Europe. But then uh, some, also some scholars in Korea and some uh, Asia, they, uh, they also uh, becoming um, rising up anyway. Um, now I uh, introduce you debates 
Ep epistemology means how you see certain things, how you see certain things, how you view certain things. So basically, the environmental sociological theories about you, in what way you see the relationship between natural environment and human society, in what, you way, in what way you explain human society in relation to natural environment, right? And new ecological paradigm, new eco uh, ecological modernization, and then uh, ecological Marxism, trade production, political ecology, events paradox, and so on, so on, so on, so on. They all trying to explain human society in relation to natural environment. And even just the thing we just finished, social constructionist, is all also the, also it's about how society members talk about uh, natural environment, right? But then somehow they they are different to each other. Some groups are they somehow concordant to each other, and some groups that they collide. They do not they do not like each other, you know. So now I introduce three parts. These are very important. These are very important. I study hard to find out this. So the first is a social realist and social constructionist perspective. The first uh, debate among environmental sociologists is uh, whether to uh, consider environmental problems real or real or constructed. So that is the uh, social realist and social constructionist perspectives. Social realist and social constructionist perspective. The second debate is between Marxist environmental sociologists and non-Marxist environmental sociologists. Do you consider uh, Arthur Moore is a Marxist or non-Marxist? Huh? Hobin? Non yeah, he's he's non-Marxist. He's non-Marxist because. Ecological modernization. Yes, yes. Because he believes that capitalism is not a bad boy for environmental problems. He believes that we can green capitalism, right? We can green capitalism. And he believes that win win game is possible. We can earn money and we can conserve the natural environment, right? We can keep going progress with the modernization project. So according to the uh, ecological paradigm theorist and um, ecological Marxist, the Arthur Moore is not a friend. Arthur Moore is a kind of mm, the ideas are colliding because to them is somehow the ecological modernization theory is a bit like anthropocentric. Probably it sounds a bit anthropocentric to uh, uh, Ryle Dunneb or, or those uh, eco Marxists, like Richard Yorg and so on. And there's another uh, the debate non human exemptionalist and new human exemptionalist. So I say. Social realist and social constructionist views. Up to the 70s and 80s, social, social realist views are dominant in environmental sociology. Nobody, uh, nobody uh, argue that environmental problems are not real. In the 70s and 80s, environmental sociologists all agree that environmental problems are real. That's then we have to find uh, solution measures to find to sol to solve environmental problems. But in the 1990s, John Hannigan brought the book, th which is titled "Environmental Sociology: A Social Constructionist Perspective" in 1996, and it, it shattered it shattered the group of environmental social it shattered the community of environmental socialists. Those times after his book publish published. Many, many years, about more than five years, all the journal articles, there's a debate between John Hannigan <laughs> and social realist. Maybe that's why he became famous, anyway. So, um, the, in two things, so John Hannigan, they say, 
I'm not saying I'm not saying that environment problems uh, do do not exist. Rather, I, I'm saying that we environmental sociologists have to uh, examine social process. Why certain parts of natural environment considered by society members having problems, and why certain parts of natural environment are not shed any light as having as, as having problems. That's his major argument. That's his major argument. So he he does not much interest in providing solution measures. He does not, but instead he researched the before for the certain for the same object. Let's say like uh, for the same object in the previous years, what people say about this. And some years later, like it's 20 years, 30 years later, what, in what way the, the, the way people talk about the same thing changed. He studied that kind of thing. And he studied also in what way the media frame environmental problems. So up to the uh, uh, late 1990s, social realists, social constructionists, they debate a lot. They're very harsh. They debate a lot. But now, uh, the, the, the debate and then the division line is becoming blurry. And they now want to uh, include the both ideas. It's like uh, if you look at hands, if you, if you look at your hand, look at your hand. The surface and the bottom, it's a bottom. The palm, OK, palm tree. Sorry, <laughs> palm or palm? Uh, it's like a palm tree. Yes. Ha ha ha. Okay. <laughs> okay. Look at your hand uh, on the surface and the palm. They have a different shapes, like right? They have a different shapes, but they are in together. But when you think about hand, which part of hand uh, uh, does come to your mind? Whether it's a uh, surface. Or palm. When you think about hand, which part first comes to your mind? Whether it's a surface or palm. So, palm, surface. So they say it's more like a two. Uh, nobody can be sure which one is correct as a theory, as a scientific theory. But then they now make a somehow. Uh, they, they, before they had a huge, uh, very uh, toxic, it's not toxic, very um, confrontation, strong confrontation to each other. But now they have, have more like a trying to include each other's view. So social realists maintain their social realist view. And then, but then they want to, they trying to list, listen to what they're talking about, even if it's, they do not like that. They're trying to listen to them, what they're trying to. And this part also, they, they're trying to uh, include their ideas. It, it's a, trying to have a more integrative idea of social realist and social constructionist. So being a sociologist, what do you have to do? The mission for being sociologist between social realists and social constructionists is very different. It's like a vision for doing sociology between Marxists and non-Marxists, right? Marxists, they say, we have to change society rather than saying blah, 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 blah. And then Marx said, all the time philosophers, they all the time interpret the world. But that's bullshit. We, need, we have to change the world. You see? But Marx said, oh, no, I'm sure I know. I cannot change. You know? Something like we have to be value neutral, we have to be a scientist, you know, being not attached to this way, this, this way. We have to you know, stand in uh, center. And then we have to make a correct 100 balanced observation you know, to know well. So it's the same uh, debate. To me, it sounds like that. It sounds like that. So uh, social realists and social constructionists, it's a very famous debate in, in environmental sociology history. It's a very famous history. And that began in the 1990s. And the idea of a social constructionist to view nature is very different from social realist. Uh, social constructionists, they consider nature as a social construct, as a cultural construct, 
and symbolic uh, symbolic thing. Okay, can I move? Okay. And Marxist and non-Marxist, Marxist and non-Marxist. So, uh, for Marxists, the enemy of society is capitalist production system, and the enemy of society members is uh, capitalist. So the old problems come from capitalist production system because capitalist production system is all about accumulating more, 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 more wealth. Never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. So uh, th there are also uh, the environmental sociologists who support those ideas, like uh, Richard York, Alan Schneiberg, and They are all ecological Marxists. They all support the Marx idea. But uh, non-Marxist, the uh, uh, Athamol and his colleagues, they are, they are non-Marxist. So t for the vision of society formation, for the what is a good society? For the vision of a uh, good society in relation to natural environment, Marxist environmental socialists and non-Marxist environmental sociologists, they clash, collide, they clash, and uh, <laughs> they do not come to the same conference. Mm. They do not like each other. Uh, 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 yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> the Marxist, non-Marxist, but I think they are very, they, all of them, they're very smart, you know? And then when they debate, I like the their very you know serious attitude and uh, passion and yeah, passion. I like them, you know. But anyway, but for the vision of good, good society, they have they are different. Non-Marxist ecological modernization theory. They they have a strong belief in modernization, which means they have a strong belief in technology, because technology is the flower of modernization, flower of modernization. And technology brings all the benefits to human society, but that's one story. But the another story, negative part of technology, you know what that is, you know? Like think about smartphone. Smartphone, you can do whatever, whatever, many things just with one smartphone, right? But what you can say with the negative things with the smartphone? Addictive. Linya? Addictive. Addictive, uh, to be specifically. Can you, you use it all the time. Yeah, and they will, ah, uh, you know, practically the school kids, and then the the secondary and junior, you know, the school children, school um, students, teachers find it very difficult to manage students in a classroom because they are very even even university students, you know, keeping all the three hours. Some some members they you know very like you know. So that's another story with the fancy technology of phone, telephone. So, but then uh, the ecological modernization theorists, they say, we should not give up modernization project, which means we should not give up technology development pro uh, project. But uh, the eco Marxists, they are somehow uh, negative about uh, technology development. You know, Yavon's paradox, it's, all, it's also about technological paradox. Do you think it's possible ecological modernization? Do you think it's, a, it's possible uh, greening capitalism? Like a capitalist, they would be voluntarily greening their production process, even if it costs them a lot of money. <coughs> what do you think, Kila? Mm, I think like in an ideal world, mm. it could be possible because you can create like environmental social justice mm. practicing and whatnot. It's just Mm -hmm. So possible, maybe maybe possible, but it, maybe it's not 100 possible, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. Damaris? Um, it might be possible, but mm -hmm. it would be extremely hard, and it, I think it only be possible when we run out of resources like oil mm -hmm. and gas and things like that. 
because in America, at least where we are, we have a debate about that. Mm -hmm. Because if you start, if you stop using oil and coal and all those things, thousands of people lose their jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you have to try to find a way to give them jobs with the environmentally safe technology. So mm -hmm. you're running on a thin line. You're going to cut off a lot of people's jobs. Mm -hmm. So you have to either A, be able to give them jobs or find mm -hmm. yes. another way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So think about whether the ecological modernization project, whether it's a feasible, uh, realistic, uh, um, pro realistic agenda for society formation. But anyway, does this ecological modernization attracted a lot of police other politicians in Europe and European project? If you mention ecological modernization, politicians they like ha ha ha, you know. Uh, anyway. Uh, but think about, think about, yeah. And I will uh, suggest so Marxist argument I, I already mentioned, and the non-Marxist argument, you know, they have they have a strong belief about technology. So they say we have to keep moving on because many people they say we have to give up industrialization. We should we should stop now producing uh, products in a fat factory and in a factory it's all ecologically set up uh, sorry it's all technological set up if you go to uh, if you visit the factory it's all packaged with the technological devices but but I, I I also want to add one point to, to ecological modernization theory I think because it's a uh, uh, you know, the too much preference of uh, ecolog the technological fix. And for me, it's, it's more like uh, inequality between uh, those countries who can develop technology on their own and those countries who cannot develop technology. So it's more like in terms of it among countries, the relationship, the global relationships between countries who have capacity to develop uh, green technology or any what sort of technology and s it's somehow new division, new divide those countries who can develop green technology and those countries who cannot uh, develop uh, green technology because technology does not it's a, uh, uh, res you need a lot of research and also you need a lot of money investment to, to create a technological uh, progress you need a lot of money, a lot of uh, time, a lot of uh, good brain, the smart brains and so on. And some countries are equipped with that kind of resources, either human resources or the capital resources and other, you know, the experience and so on. But some countries, you know, lack of the kind of uh, resources. And non-human ecogemptionalists, new human ecogemptionalists, so this, this uh, debate is about how we conceptualize human beings, how we con conceptualize human beings. So new ecological paradigm theories, ecological Marxists, they all agree that humans are part of natural system. Humans are part of natural system. But then the, uh, the uh, ecological Marxist theorists, they consider those ideas are too much green. Those those ide ideas too much that they trying to um, conceptualize human human beings in a too much way. Okay, so these are my product. So in environmental sociology, th these are four major uh, epistemology groups. These are, these are important, right? These are four major Im environmental sociology groups. So if you want to develop any theory, you consider uh, th whether you are Marxist or ecological modernist or new ecological paradigm supporters or social constructionist. So there's a question, are environmental problems are real? And these two groups so say yes. Environmental problems are real. And social construction sure say, I'm not quite sure. Maybe real, but I'm not quite sure. And I do not want to say whether it exists or not. And the second question is, what causes the environmental problems? Marxists say capitalist, capitalist. Uh, so we need a degrowth. 
degrowth means reducing the amount of wealth. And the ecological Marxists say it's the environmental problems comes with the failure of environmental <coughs> governance. So if you very very organized, whether it's a company or what sort of uh, social institutions, considering uh, ecological impact, we can solve environmental problems. And capitalism is not necessarily the evidence for environmental problems. And we need to solve environmental problems. We need a green technology that comes with a good uh, environmental governance. And new ecological paradigm uh, theory supporters, they say the, it, the environmental problems are caused by the strong belief that humans are exempt from, uh, from uh, natural laws. So we have to get off this, uh, this strong belief. Is modernity project worthwhile to keep ahead? Um, the mo ecological modernists, they say the modernity project they should, uh, should keep ahead. But the Marxists the new ecological paradigms they are somehow uh, not so sure about, uh, about, about the, the positive aspect of modernity project. And what should the environmental soci sociologists do? Uh, social constructionists, they consider uh, environmental sociologists should uh, find out the social process by which uh, certain aspect of natural environment picked up to have uh, problems and to share the by society members to, to, to have problems. And these three groups are, these three groups uh, answer to this question is we have to find solution measures to environmental problems. So in environmental sociology, there are four major uh, theory uh, thinkers and they somehow concord, the agree to each other and they somehow break, break apart each other. And, and these are quite important. Okay?